Hello and welcome to this tutorial on transmission lines and ABCD matrices. We'll begin with a definition. Throughout this tutorial, we use the term transmission line to mean a mathematical and physical concept that allows us to propagate energy from one place to another in a manner consistent with wave-like behavior. Transmission lines allow us to account for the wave speed, attenuation, and length of the line. And their concepts are applicable equally to acoustic and electromagnetic propagation. A previous tutorial in this series discusses electrical acoustical analogies, and we will be looking at both acoustic and electrical examples of transmission lines throughout this tutorial. If we're considering propagation through heterogeneous or layered media, we normally start with a solution to the wave equation. Here, the wave equation is shown in 3D alongside its second order spatial derivative operator. For compactness of notation, I will consider solutions of this in one dimensions only. And here we can see it comprises an amplitude term, F0, with an exponential term. If we're looking again at heterogeneous media, we would then apply boundary conditions at the interface. This typically takes the form of continuity of a physical parameter at the interface. In acoustics problems, this is typically continuity of pressure or the normal component of particle velocity. In electromagnetics, we'd be looking at the normal component of the E and H fields. And finally, we'd repeat this at each subsequent interface. Solutions of this form can be long winded and mathematically complex, which is what leads us in a search towards a simpler way of expressing these problems. But this is where we start to consider transmission lines. Consider a general transmission line, which is characterized by characteristic impedance, Z0, propagation constant, gamma, and a length, L. In general, there'll be two wave modes traveling left to right, the incoming wave and the outgoing wave. Similarly, traveling right to left will be an inbound and an outbound wave. Our propagation constant is a complex valued quantity. The real part of this, the wave number, K, is associated with oscillation and radiation of the wave. And the imaginary component, alpha, deals with absorption. Let's look in that propagation constant a little more detail. First, we need to recall that Euler's relationship tells us that any complex valued exponential can be decomposed into cosinusoidal and sinusoidal components. Similarly, our wave speed is the product of frequency and wavelength, or alternatively expressed as the ratio of angular frequency and wave number. So, the general solution of our one dimensional wave equation, shown here, has this complex exponential term, which, if we separate out, allows us to consider a spatial term and a temporal term. Let's consider that spatial term in a little more detail. We'll include the expansion for gamma, which is k plus i alpha, and we'll note that i squared is minus one, so that that allows us to express this term as again the product of two exponentials, one of which has a real argument and the other has a complex valued argument. Now we note that the real valued argument is just going to become exponentially smaller as x increases. However, because of Euler's relationship, we note that the oscillatory term, which has got the imaginary argument, allows us to consider the oscillation and propagation of the wave. Another important concept in transmission lines is that of input impedance. Again, considering our arbitrary transmission line, we can apply a load impedance to that. Now, we may well be interested in determining what this loaded transmission line looks like if we're looking into it 
from the available port on the left hand side. And the effect of the loaded transmission line can be summarized in the term Z in or input impedance. The real advantage of input impedance is if we need to consider additional transmission lines. In this case, we can simply represent the loaded grey transmission line with a simple term of its input impedance. And once again, we're at the situation where we have a new transmission line with a new load, and we can work out a new input impedance accordingly. We can repeat this for any subsequent transmission lines that we add, and it therefore becomes trivial to add more layers, just propagating the system forward as we've seen. If we consider a general voltage source driving through a source impedance into a transmission line that is loaded with ZL, we know that we can effectively replace the loaded line with an input impedance. And therefore we can express the reflection and transmission coefficients with an equation like this for reflection, which is simply the difference of the input impedance and the source impedance over the sum of input and source impedances, or the transmission coefficient, which is twice the input impedance divided by sum of input and source impedances. It's important to recall that these are amplitude, reflection and transmission coefficients. For quantities based on energy, such as intensity or power, reflection and transmission coefficients take a slightly different form. So how do we calculate input impedance? So for a loaded transmission line shown thus, our input impedance would be calculated with this equation. Notice here that it involves both the characteristic impedance of the transmission line and the impedance loading it, and Koch and Seinch terms that have an argument of gamma L. Now we have multiple Koch and Seinch terms and these correspond to the oscillations associated with each of the four wave modes incoming and outbound on the left to right and right directions that we saw previously. We've mentioned a lot about characteristic impedance, but how do we determine that? I'm going to consider here an electrical example, but equally this applies to an acoustic concept as well. If we start with our input impedance equation, we're going to start by considering what happens if we're in an open circuit situation. In this case, ZL tends towards infinity. And terms with the Z0 coefficient will become vanishingly small compared to those terms with a ZL coefficient. And so we can effectively ignore those prefixed by Z0. Notice that there's a ZL in both the numerator and the denominator, and we can simplify the two hyperbolic terms with tanch, so that the input impedance under open circuit conditions can be expressed as Z0 tanch gamma L. We now undertake the same analysis, but for short circuit conditions. Here, ZL tends to zero, and so anything with a ZL coefficient will disappear. In this case, we also have Z0 in the numerator and denominator, which will cancel. And we can once again rationalize the Seinch and Koch terms so that the input impedance under short circuit conditions becomes Z0 tanch gamma L. We can take the product of these two conditions. And we find that because this then gives us a cancellation of the tanch terms, the product of Z in under open circuit and Z in under short circuit conditions is simply Z naught squared. So taking the square root of the left hand side allows us to evaluate the characteristic impedance. Let's look at a simple transmission line element in an electrical example. This is made up of a resistive and an inductive component in series and a conductance and a capacitance in parallel. Notice the prime. This indicates that all of our quantities are per unit length. 
This is one of the strengths of a transmission line, that if we have a longer piece of cable or a longer circuit board track, we can simply multiply our per unit length quantities by this to get the actual resistance, inductance, conductance and capacitance that this may represent. The propagation constant is simply the product of two terms. The first of these is formed from the series components R and L and is R plus J omega L. The second term is from the parallel components. Note that these same two bracketed terms appear in the expression for the characteristic impedance of an electrical line. But this time, it is the ratio of the two bracketed terms rather than their product. And in both cases, we need to make sure that there's an appropriate square root. Let's now consider an acoustic example of how we might build up a transmission line and its load. And here we'll be looking at a, the basic structure of a needle hydrophone. Signal will be incident from water. It will propagate into the active element of PVDF via a bonding layer of epoxy and ultimately propagate into the backing conductor, which is copper. The equivalent transmission line circuit for this is as shown. Here, it's drawn as a voltage source, but in effect, it's a source of amplitude, so it could be pressure or force or particle velocity. We note that each of the transmission lines has got a characteristic impedance and a propagation constant. And here, the propagation constant is given by the angular frequency divided by the wave speed in that material, plus the imaginary I multiplied by our absorption constant. There will be a similar expression for the propagation constant for the epoxy as well. Ultimately, the load impedance is the copper of the conductor that is behind the stack. Thus far, we've considered transmission line components, but we'll now look to see how that forms part of a two port network. Consider an arbitrary network defined by four constants A, B, C, and D. If this is driven by a voltage source, Vs, via a, a source resistor, Zs, we will note that a current flows into the network. But because there is some voltage drop across Zs, we won't see all of Vs applied across the terminals of the network. In fact, we'll see a smaller voltage, V1. On the load side, we will also have a load impedance and potentially a voltage source VL and of course a current that flows. By the same arguments as we saw on the source side, we will also not see all of VL developed across the ports of the ABCD network and will instead see V2. It's important to note we can also calculate our input impedance looking from the one side and from the two side. And if we're looking at a situation where we're dealing solely with a transmitter, then the voltage source on the load side, VL, will be zero. Whereas if this device is solely a receiver, then the source voltage on the source side, VS, will be zero. We can encapsulate the relationships between various voltages and currents in a very compact notation as shown below. Now let's look at the implementation of some standard circuit components via ABCD matrices. If we have a simple series impedance, this looks very much like the identity matrix, but with the upper right zero term replaced by the impedance of the component Z. A parallel component again looks like the identity matrix, but this time the lower left component is replaced by the admittance or one over Z of the component. Transformers can also be represented. And here we see that the unity terms of the identity matrix are replaced by n and the 1 over n in the upper left and bottom right terms respectively. 
And finally, if we want to consider a generic transmission line term, then we would need this matrix, and we recognize the Koch and Seitch terms from our input impedance equation previously. So with these very simple four term matrices, we can represent any combination of series and parallel components, transformers, and transmission lines. If we wish to look at a combination of these terms, much as we would cascade the circuit elements, we can also cascade the ABCD matrices. So here we have a series component, series impedance, followed by a transformer, followed by a parallel impedance. And if we wanted to know the net effect of all of these terms combined, we could simply multiply the matrices in order to come up with a new four term ABCD matrix. In fact, we can come up with a matrix approach to describe absolutely any system we care to think of. Having defined a single ABCD matrix, we can then derive some really interesting quantities from this. These ratios are formed as follows. If we're simply looking at the ratio of V1 to I1, this is our input impedance on the one side, Z1, then we notice that it is simply a ratio of two terms involving the load impedance and ABCD. If we're to look at the transmit sensitivity, so this is the case when VL equals zero, what we're interested in knowing is what is the ratio of source voltage to that which gets developed across the load impedance, ZL, which is going to be V2. So the ratio of V2 over ZS is given by source and load impedances, and once again, our four ABCD components. Finally, if we're considering a receiving device, here we note that Vs is going to be zero, and so we're interested in what is the ratio of Vl and V1, the source side voltage that is applied across Zs. And once again, we find this can be expressed solely in terms of source and load impedances and the four ABCD matrix components. We can see, therefore, that transmission lines simplify the analysis of layered media. And by using ABCD matrices, the whole process is even easier. We hope you found this tutorial interesting. If you did, come back and find some more of the Precision Acoustics tutorial videos.